Okay. Well, uh, thank you for joining um, tonight. And uh, I will be talking about uh, underwater prehistoric archaeology. So this is not a very common uh, path for archaeologists. And I promise there not, will not be a single picture of a gold doubloon or a pirate ship. Um, we're talking about sites that, in this case, are all older than about 6,000 years ago. And the time period I'm really interested in, and, and most of my colleagues are interested in, is the late Pleistocene, early Holocene, what's known as the Paleo-Indian period and um, early Archaic. So to give us a little idea about the time period we're talking about and some of the things that will come up tonight, um, we're just out of the last glacial period about uh, 11, about 11,000 years ago, it ended with the start of the Holocene and uh, the last glacial maximum, which is the maximum extent of glacial ice uh, was about 22,000 years ago. We're interested in what the first people in the new world, uh, when they got here, who they were, um, all that is totally up in the air these days. But it, I will be talking about a site, um, a famous site actually, a Paige Latson site, which is south of Tallahassee in Florida. And it's um, what's called a pre-Clovis site. So most of you have probably heard of Clovis. Uh, Clovis is a Paleo-Indian, uh, a Paleo-Indian culture group uh, famous for its fluted point. And it's, it's the only really uh, earliest uh, culture group that is uh, universally accepted. Uh, people before that time uh, may be accepted, they may not be accepted um, a as a legitimate uh, archeological cultures, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, after the last glacial maximum, things began to warm up in North America and Europe, and the ice began to melt. And as the ice melted, the sea level rose until we get to about 12,700 years ago when there was a reversal in which uh, the world got much, went back to glacial conditions. And that's a time period called the Younger Dryas. Marks sort of the end of Clovis and the start of a new time period. Uh, Paleo-Indian time period, uh, but with a number of different point types, which is how we define culture groups during that time. And finally, we get to the Holocene, which is the modern period. So the Younger Dryas is over, the glacial time period is over for most of what's now the United States. And uh, that's when we begin to see the early archaic uh, notch points come in. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of sites that are about 7,000 years ago, but I won't really be talking about anything after 8,000, which for me and my colleagues, well, not me so much, but for my colleagues, colleagues, they call that Holocene trash. It's just stuff that they're not all that interested in, and it's disparaging, but nonetheless, we'll be focusing on this early time period. <clears throat> so here's uh, sort of what the world looked, North America looked like at the last glacial maximum. This is the maximum extent of ice at that time. And um, these are possible entry ways uh, in which uh, people got to the new world. That could be one or more of them. But there's one thing I want you to take a look at, and that is the size of Florida. So as the ice gets, water gets um, tied up in these giant ice sheets, it lowers the sea level and it lowers the sea level significantly. So maybe about 300 feet at the maximum. So you can see that Florida, uh, which we know from this light tan looking uh, extent was about twice the size during the last glacial maximum. And so sites that are on the coast now would have been far inland. And here's an idea, here's to give you an idea of how thick this ice was. So over Montreal, the ice was two miles thick. Over Toronto, a mile and 1.3 miles. Chicago, a half a mile. And so that's a lot of ice and it's very heavy and it pushes the earth down. And what's called, uh, uh, 
well, it's pushing the earth down uh, sometimes to significant degrees and it creates what's called a four bulge in front of the ice sheet. And the four bulge in this area was in Southern Virginia. So uh, that was a significant rise in the elevation of the land. And then the ice sheet, which was in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, would have affected uh, both the climate and the landscape and all sorts of stuff. But down in Florida, things were pretty mild and relatively speaking. And so this is a map uh, which shows where most of the water is coming when the glaciers are melting. It's coming down the Mississippi River, which must have been a roaring icy torrent that could not be crossed by people, except probably in the deep freeze uh, when uh, it would freeze over and they could walk across it. But otherwise, it's unlikely people would, were canoeing across that. This shows Florida was full of cypress. Probably not. Um, probably more grasslands and uh, drier conditions. And uh, we have our host of Pleistocene mammals. One thing that's interesting about Florida is that most of the large mammals uh, seem to be related to South America and are less closely related to the rest of North America. So there's a couple of camels, there's a giant armadillo, uh, three kinds of sloth, a couple of elephant relate relatives, and um, but it's what we'd expect at the end of the Pleistocene to have uh, elsewhere in North America. And they're big carnivores. So the one on the upper left is called the short-faced bear, probably the most dangerous carnivore around. These are extinct now, but they had long legs and were estimated to run as fast as 40 miles an hour. So they could outrun a horse. So there's no defending against the short-faced bear. And some people think that's why the population is really there were dire wolves, and then this largest lion that ever lived, the American lion, which is the one on the right uh, end of this uh, group of uh, felines at the bottom. And Florida produces uh, jaguars and leopards and this American lion, and then a whole host of other carnivores. Now Clovis, I talked about uh, these are Clovis points. They're pretty ubiquitous throughout North America, although mostly found in the east. They have what's called a flute. That's this uh, flake that's taken off the base. Nobody really knows what the function of these things are. Here's a guy throwing a, a dart with a Clovis point at the end of it. Uh, I'm not even sure that that's what they were for. They could have been knives. Nobody really knows. And the Clovis toolkit looks like this. So. It's uh, not that distinctive, although there's some distinctive parts of it, but it really doesn't tell you much about filling out the uh, material culture of uh, Clovis people. And you, you really don't know a lot about what they did. There are a few organic tools that have been found. Uh, these are some bone points and then this uh, unique what they call the bone wrench made out of the leg of a mastodon or a mammoth. And it looks like at least the points were hafted for some purpose. Uh, again, not a lot to go on. So if you want to know more about uh, these early cultures, you need to find out where these organic tools are preserved. Uh, otherwise you're just dealing with, with uh, stone tools. And so where are you going to find these things? Well, you can find them two places. One is where it's cold and dry like Alaska, which has in some places great organic preservation. And the other place is where it's been wet for 13,000 years or more like Florida sinkholes. And uh, that's what I'm going to focus on tonight. So at that time, late Pleistocene, Florida was probably a large grasslands. It had uh, herds of elephants, herds of horses or zebras, uh, lots of camels, and they uh, uh, are mostly browsers or mostly uh, grazers. And so they're both um, changing the landscape, but also uh, loving it down here. And at that time, uh, water levels in the aquifer were very low because sea level had dropped. And so 
it was probably pretty dry. Um, and if you wanted to access water on a regular basis, which humans and animals must do, you usually were probably uh, finding them in these scattered sinkholes. So Florida, the base rock in Florida is uh, limestone. It's karstic, meaning it dissolves and it uh, collapses. And uh, so this is a picture of a sinkhole, large sinkhole south of Tallahassee. And that's the level of the aquifer. So when the aquifer drops 30 feet, that water level is way, way down there. And this is an attractant to people and animals. <clears throat> And so here's a picture of the Santa Fe River on the left. Uh, this is in central Florida. There's lots of artifacts in it. Uh, and this is the picture on the right is the Santa Fe River during an extended drought. And that's what I envision the rivers in Florida now probably looked like. They were probably seasonally running, but not very often. And uh, Florida has a long history of uh, fossil collection. So a little bit about how I got started on this. I uh, <clears throat> grew up in the DC area. I remember standing in front of the big elephant at the Natural History Museum uh, when I was five or six and say, I'm gonna be a paleontologist or I'm gonna study human evolution. And uh, I did get an undergraduate degree in anthropology, but then I took a right turn and became an environmental lawyer uh, for the state of Florida, which I did for a couple of decades. And um, as that slowly sucked my soul away, I was looking for other uh, things to do. And one is uh, somebody said, well, there's a lot of fossils here. And so I got involved in fossil collection and uh, cataloging and worked with a museum in Florida with this stuff. And one day I found a piece of a human skull <laughs> and I turned it into the state archeologist and I said, uh, can I volunteer on something? And he said, go, go down the hall and talk to this guy, Jim Dunbar. So I did. And uh, Jim had a, uh, a uh, fiberglass cast of a mastodon tibia, I think it was. And I was like, okay, this is my guy. And uh, I applied and I became a volunteer on the Paige Latson site, which we'll talk about. And I absolutely loved it. And I met Michael Fought there was another pioneer along with Jim in uh, underwater prehistoric archaeology. And I ended up going to Florida State University and getting my degree. <clears throat> so that, that's my tale of how I got into this. But these guys, well, they were dredging fossils out of Wakulla Springs, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, class one freshwater springs in the world. It just pumps out millions of gallons an hour. And it, at the, at the end of the Pleistocene, it was dry. And so animals would walk down to the bottom to find water and they would die there. Or they'd be killed there by humans. And uh, people went down and uh, collected all this, all these artifacts and these uh, skeletal remains. And then in the late 1940s, Jacques Cousteau invents the scuba gear or uh, scuba apparatus, and uh, it became a big hit. And so a number of avocational archeologists and paleontologists, these are two of them, Ben Waller and Alvin Hendricks, began to go diving in Florida rivers. And they found a lot of uh, fauna remains, like beautifully preserved uh, elephants and other animals and artifacts. <clears throat> and these guys <clears throat> were great because they kept uh, detailed notes about where they found stuff. They tried to engage professionals whenever they could. On the flip side was a guy like Bill Royal, <clears throat> who I think he was a Navy diver and uh, he lived down near a site called Little Salt Springs. There's another site right near called Warm Mineral Springs and it had a number of human burials in them. And the, he would collect the burials and then he would actually cement them into his fireplace. That's the picture on the right. And after he died, his wife called the state archeologist said, would you come chip this stuff out of here? And so they did. Uh, so all, this, all these human remains were there. And so Bill Royal is like at the other end of the spectrum as far as collectors are concerned. But 
people like uh, uh, Hendrix and Waller were trying to get these professionals involved and the professionals were just being really snooty about the whole thing. They didn't want to deal with these guys. And, and they kept saying, no, you got to come out with it, come out with this. And so finally they hooked up with a young paleontologist. This is him, Dave Webb in the sixties at the university of Florida. And Dave was a diver and he said, okay, I'll go look. And, and when Dave, uh, took a tour of the Oscilla River, where the Page Latin site is, which is really a set of sinkholes. He said there was a complete elephant skeleton at the bottom of every single one of them. And so he was totally hooked, and suddenly they had professional um, uh, cred to go forward, and uh, they were off and running. Dave, can I interrupt for just a moment? Yes, There's a, sure. a question in the chat about what you were just talking about. Can you comment on the, the ongoing controversy about museums keeping human remains? Uh, I can. Uh, I, I actually teach an ethics class at George Washington where we talk about this issue. Um, <clears throat> I, have a, I have a personal opinion about it, and that is that if you can establish a connection you as the person who's making a claim in this, in most cases in North America, it's a, it's a tribe, an American Indian tribe. If you can establish a cultural connection to that, then it should be returned. But uh, some of the remains, that, which I'll talk about later, are 8,000 years old. And I think my personal opinion is that it's difficult to make that claim. Because I think about my heritage in England and northern Germany, uh, what my people were doing 8,000 years ago, it's hard to say. And that's not really necessarily a good uh, analog for that position. But I think there is uh, scientific value and that there's also um, people value their ancestors and it's, I don't know, that's not really an answer, but it's not an easy thing to answer. Yeah, totally. No, thank you. That helps. <laughs> but I'm happy to talk about it uh, in more detail later. So in uh, the 1960s, uh, Ben Waller introduced uh, uh, archaeologist at the University of Florida, Charles Hoffman, who was also a diver, to this site in the Silver River. And this was called the uh, Guest Mammoth site. It was named after a guy named Guest who found it. And you can see that this picture that was taken, that the water is crystal clear and uh, there are uh, mastodon bones lying all over the place here. And so Hoffman got very interested in, and he conducted an underwater excavation with some students and um, determined inferred that these were these uh, animals had been at least scavenged by people just based upon the distribution of the bones. And they found this little point, the one on the right. Now it looks like a flute, but I can tell you it's about half the length of your pinky. It's really tiny, so don't, it's not too exciting. And it's lost now anyway, but there are casts of it. But when you look back at the notes, uh, Hoffman was way ahead of his time. So it was careful excavation, uh, detailed uh, notes, no jumping to crazy con conclusions. And he presented this at the Society for American Archaeology in the 70s. And uh, for those of you who understand what this means, he was given the last slot on Sunday morning where everybody has left town pretty much by then. And he was... Uh, people got up in the middle of the talk and walked out, and uh, he was just sort of excoriated, excoriated and, and kind of uh, wrecked his professional career. Now things have turned around, but that's just to give you an idea of what these professionals were facing when they wanted to do excavations underwater. So here we are in Florida. This is the Page Latson site. Here's the Wakulla Springs site. Uh, you can see that they're both on rivers that are close to the coast, but this is where they were located during the last glacial maximum and probably around Clovis times, not, not much different. So way far inland. 
And this area that is now underwater had to have been populated by people. So there are probably lots and lots of sites out here uh, that have not been found yet. So here's the Osceola River, this is a map of it. It's this uh, river that runs between the yellow and the white or the gray part of the map. It is uh, fed by the aquifer and it is dark water. It is as dark as it can be. And then it's fed also by the Wasissa River, which is over here on the left. This is spring fed and this is uh, clear water. It's beautiful. And where these come together uh, down here at number one is where Paige Ladson is. So here is an aerial uh, side, uh, uh, image of it. It's this X. Here's the uh, Wasissa River coming in. And the Osceola River is uh, a karstic river. So it actually goes underground for a while and pops up again in the sinkhole and goes underground. So it, it, a lot of the flow from the Osceola River is, is underground, subterranean. <clears throat> Here's a picture of uh, the site. The site is over here to the right. Here's the clean Wasissa River coming in, here, or the clear Wasissa, Wasissa, and here's this tannic dark Osceola River. Now this, at the time of about uh, 12,500 years ago, uh, maybe about 14,000 years ago, this was a, uh, not a flowing river, it was a pond because the water levels were so much lower, it was not flowing at that time. And here are some excavation units. There's many more excavation units now. There was a land bridge that went across that is uh, subsequently collapsed, probably uh, about 7,000 years ago. And here is a, uh, a cross section of the stratigraphy. And so this is the bottom of the river down here. There's this, uh, part, the uh, unit three, which is the straw map we'll be talking about. And then unit five, which is this little red unit right here, which uh, marks the start of the Holocene. There's no Clovis here. <clears throat> it was probably all underwater during Clovis time. So nobody was hanging out there. So when they were digging before I started, uh, they ran into this, they got down here to unit three and they, they called it the straw map because it was tons of little pieces of, um, well, I'll talk about that in a second. So this is the way the archeology span goes on the Asilla and actually in any sort of underwater prehistoric excavation. It's an excavation frame that's set uh, in the unit. There are two divers. One is holding the dredge head, the other is, uh, they both have lights and uh, they usually have surface supplied air so they can, we would stay down for two hours at a time. <clears throat> and um, somebody is troweling along and then that gets sucked up into the dredge hose, the dredge head and out onto this screen barge where it's just like the screen you have in a, ter in a terrestrial excavation. And then people are on this screen barge looking through stuff, just like you would on a screen. There's a water pump that goes on here. And at Page Lats in uh, unit three is about 30 feet under water. And it, it's black like this, really dark. So here's the uh, excavation frame. Uh, we're working from pontoon boats. Uh, this boat on the left is actually sinking a little bit, you can't tell. and. In the early days when I started, all this was volunteer uh, equipment. So they had no money really. They got uh, some money every year from a National Geographic, but not very much. You can uh, core from these pontoon boats. You uh, drill a hole in the center and then pound these uh, irrigation aluminum tubes in. Very important part of uh, figuring out what's going on under the sediments below. And here's a picture of what it looks like at the Page Ladson site. So here we have the pontoons that are uh, a lot of the equipment's on. Uh, the screen deck is where these people are sitting. Here's the dredge and the divers are underneath the water. Very idyllic, although there are several uh, poisonous snakes that live there and there's always an alligator or two that are drifting by. But 
you can see on the left that this is uh, very much like a terrestrial site, except you're underwater. Here's a, we have a laser level to make sure that uh, to uh, help with uh, measuring where artifacts or features are. Here's the dredge hose. This person is uh, using a trowel to uh, move sediments into that. And then this is the kind of thing that we were pulling up. So this is uh, ulna, I think, of uh, mastodon or mam. It would have been a mastodon here, beautifully preserved and uh, not an uncommon find. So if you're looking for pre-Clovis, which in this case we were, it's very controversial. There's a lot of sites with bad context, questionable artifacts. There are not many sites. Why would that be? And questionable dates. But the one thing you really need is old dirt. If you're not digging in the right aged dirt, you're not going to find a pre-Clovis site that's going to pass muster. And so um, early on, uh, well, this is the, this to go back to the straw mat. So this is uh, came out of the straw mat. And uh, people couldn't figure out what it was. It was tons and tons of this uh, small, like uh, one inch or two inch pieces of um, cypress twigs. And uh, then somebody realized that that matches the distance between these two cusps on a mastodon tooth. And mastodons are browsers. And so this represents uh, mastodon digestive, which is really mastodon poop. Um, tons of it down there, perfectly preserved. Uh, in fact, you could smell it uh, still, even though it was about 14,000 years old. <clears throat> and while they were digging down there in sort of the uh, early days of uh, Page Lats, and they came across this tusk, which was lying in the digesta. And it's got a couple of aspects to it, which indicated that it might have been uh, collected by humans, although never taken out. And that is this, this line right here is where the tusk enters the skull. But back here are these little cut marks. And this is actually the way uh, tusks are taken out of elephants in Africa. They, they break this thin section of the, of the skull off, and then they cut the tendons here, and then they slip the slip the tusk out. And these artifacts, if they are, some of them are artifacts, some may not be, were found in the screen. So not found in situ, uh, but nonetheless coming up on the screen. And so the people that ran the site were claiming it was pre-Clovis, but it was kind of uh, iffy. And actually me working there, I was like, no, nah, I'm not so sure about this. It's, it's not airtight. Now, this is a picture of the cut marks, uh, the supposed cut marks. They look like cut marks, um, but still equivocal. So <clears throat> that part of the project closed down about 2002. And in 2012, Mike Waters with the Center for the First Americans at Texas A&M uh, sponsored another excavation there. So they reopened the old excavations and it, this was a truly a professional operation. So before it was like $10,000 a year, now it's $100,000 a year. And it was run by Jesse Halligan, one of his students, and then be, she became a professor at uh, Florida State running their underwater program. And since that time, uh, there have been a number of uh, excavations uh, sponsored by Texas A&M, and then uh, Jesse runs a field school here every summer. So uh, there's ongoing excavations all the time. And in this case, they found unequivocal evidence of early humans. And, um, and that is in the form of this biface. It's not diagnostic, but it's clearly an artifact. And it was excavated in the straw mat. This little guy I pulled personally out of the wall of the excavation. It's clearly an artifact and did not drift in. And so suddenly there were lots of artifacts which showed that it's clearly a uh, pre-Clovis age site. And you can see that <clears throat> water's paid for a lot of radiocarbon dates. And, and it's uh, not a mixed up sediment. 
Um, so it satisfies a number of these, is it a pre-Clovis site? And I became convinced. <clears throat> Further up the column, in that thin red strat I was talking about, there's something called the Bolin surface. And in that surface, which dates to about 11,500 to 11,000, looks like it was exposed for at least 500 years, there were wooden stakes that were driven into the ground, still there. This is a one version of the Bowen point that was found there. Um, and here are some of the other Bowen points. Here's the stake again. There's another carved uh, hickory stake, bone pins. And so lots of organic preservation. <clears throat> this uh, antler with the tines cut off was found. So uh, clear evidence that people are you know, using these organic materials. And then Another thing that happens in the Oscilla is great fossil preservation. It also has great ivory tool preservation. So these, these are uh, three views of the same ivory shaft. Uh, this is probably where it was hafted, where it's scarred here. Um, it would take a lot of time to make these out of ivory, but there are lots and lots of them. In fact, there's more ivory shafts came out of this area than anywhere in the new, new world and, and maybe close to anywhere in the world. So I think some places in Europe and Asia have a lot also. So suddenly, uh, this is looking like a great place to do early people archaeology. This, uh, this is in a private collection, but it's a ivory barbed point. It's a unique one. These things, there's about three or four of these that have been found. These are called daggers, but nobody really knows what they are. They all have drill holes in the uh, non-working end, and they're made from horses or camel legs, leg bones. It's a number of other tools that have been found that are also made from Pleistocene mammals. <clears throat> these are uh, fish hooks made from horse toe bones or astragalus. Um, and Page Latson is not the only site in the area. So this is a couple of miles up the Wasissa River, this Ryan Harley site. And these are middle Paleoindians. So these are about a thousand years younger um, than Clovis and uh, same sort of setup. But here you're looking at fresh water and only two feet deep. It was a great place to dig. I really enjoyed it. <clears throat> so, People are excited about this. And uh, Michael Fought and Jim Dunbar thought, well, we should go offshore. So the Oscilla River, the Page Latson site is just a few miles, maybe uh, 10 miles from the coastline. But what they did is they would track out these paleo channels. This is in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, where the paleo channels were, they were still apparent and then would go out and talk to people who scalloped or fishermen or look at the uh, rock snags on the, on the navigation charts. And they would go look at those places. And sure enough, there were uh, sites all over in this shallow water. And uh, here's some uh, Pleistocene fauna and artifacts. And again, it's the same sort of setup that we saw on the, in the Oscilla. And these are all, this is the Oscilla River that's up here in the upper right. These are all sites that have been documented and recorded uh, prehistoric sites. And I think the youngest is about 6,000 years old. And you can tell how old they are by looking at their location um, or their depth, because as the, as the water rose through time, uh, they would become covered at a particular date and you knew that people were not living underwater and therefore they were at least that old uh, before they became covered. Our co-op and some others are doing more work in this area to find other sites and, uh, and actually relocate some of these sites which were identified long before there was GPS. So their uh, locations are difficult to find. <clears throat> now I'm gonna go I'm going to jump ahead in time to a site called Windover. And it's just another example of uh, the amazing organic um, preservation in Florida um, due to its wet nature at this time. So early on in, in 
the oscilla, it's wet, but it's not mucky. This is more a, a pond. It's about seven to 8,000 years old. And it's a big burial pond. It was found by a developer who luckily called the archeologists, set up a big operation here, and they excavated 164 skeletons. There are more out there that they didn't touch. These were so well preserved. This is brain material that was preserved inside these skulls. You can see that the skin and flesh is all gone, but the skeletons have not really moved much since they were put in the ground. There's organic artifacts. So this is an animal handle. There's a bone pin through the, uh, the, along this skull. There were stomach contents. So you could see what people are eating and, and really get an idea of where they were traveling around in the area that long ago. And this is uh, the way they seem to have been buried on their side, covered in fabric, covered over with uh, sticks, weighted down by logs, and then pinned down with these um, other sticks that would hold people in place. And because of the distribution in this pond, it looks like these were family members or clan groups, you know, there was separation that way. And they were put in this pond within 48 hours of death. So somebody died and wherever they were, they were hurried over and then interred in this way. Pretty fascinating. Now these uh, burials have been found throughout Florida, but Windover is the biggest one so far on land and uh, the one that's been excavated. Right now, there's another one that's been found off the coast of Venice Beach. That's uh, this location right here. It's, I don't know, it's about half a mile off the shore, I think. And it has way more burials, estimated burials, number of burials than Windover. So at that time, about 7,000 years ago, this would have been dry, it would have been a pond, sea level would have been lower. <clears throat> and um, Right now, the archaeologists are trying to figure out what to do. They're not going to excavate them all. They're, I don't know. They're, they'll excavate some, I think, but by and large, you're going to leave them in place and then try to preserve them. It was reported by a diver, private diver or avocational diver, who was unsure whether he had a coconut or a human skull. That's the story. And anyway, the archaeologists then jumped on it. And this is a picture of some of the excavation going on. So again, Beautifully preserved wood that's 7,000 years old. Um, there's apparently uh, some uh, skeletal remains that seem to have uh, shell necklaces and uh, other shell adornments. Um, so we'll see how all that plays out. So what does the future hold? <clears throat> so our co-op has been uh, working in the Gulf, as I said. But we're also doing, uh, looking for other sites that might preserve these uh, organic remains of early people. And so in my dissertation work, I uh, was interested in artifact shapes, Paleo-Indian artifact shapes, and, to, and I wanted to get a large data set. So I had to uh, work with a lot of collectors. And um, one of these collectors is a guy named Delwood Nelson. In this part of the state, this green area has never had never really had any sort of uh, Paleo Indian or early archaic uh, signature. Like there weren't very many artifacts. And uh, this Lake George, which is the second largest lake in Florida, is really just a wide part in the St. Johns River. So the St. Johns runs from about Orlando up to Jacksonville and empties out. It's a very slow moving, shallow river by and large. And Lake George is eight miles across and about 20 miles long. And so uh, Delwood told us where the site was and he had 44 of these points, these Swanee points. So these are post Clovis in age, <clears throat> probably another, at least that many with other collections making it the largest Paleo-Indian site in Florida. And the nice thing about it, although this site was totally blitzed by collectors, there was nothing left when we went back to look. <clears throat> the nice thing about Lake George is that it's uh, really dark and tannic. 
uh, and people don't really dive there. And it's a place where the Florida Freshwater Fish Commission drops problem alligators. So if you've got a big problem alligator in your backyard, they'll capture it and usually release it in Lake George. And so it's full of alligators. And when I met Delwood, he proudly showed me where he'd been bitten across the thigh by an alligator. There was two rows of teeth marks there. So the nice thing about that for archeologists is it keeps the collectors out. <clears throat> so we used, uh, in our first grant, we used something called a sub-bottom profiler. And uh, that's this device down here. This is called the tow fish. <laughs> and it's a device that sends out sound waves, sound signals of certain frequencies that then hit the bottom and go back up to a speaker, uh, or not a speaker, but a hydrophone or a microphone. And, uh, and then based upon uh, the speed of sound in water and, uh, and it will, and the analysis of the acoustic signal, you can get an idea of what the surface is like but also what's under the surface. So it will, re, uh, some of the sound will penetrate the surface and then bounce off the next layer and so on. It's almost always used for geological purposes um, <clears throat> and a tiny, tiny fraction of it is used by archeologists. And this is what it's like to run it. So you drive your boat very slowly and somebody that's me looks at the monitor to see what's going on. <clears throat> But this is what you end up with. And so Lake George is uh, very boring on the surface. It's all about nine to 12 feet deep, flat as can be. The only thing you really see are lost crab traps. And so, um, you know, that's about it. Sometimes a sunken boat, it's a John boat, but under the surface, there's all sorts of features. And uh, I don't know if you can see this very well, but these are paleo channels, uh, there'd be a rise here. Um, there's a lots of stuff going on here. These are uh, what are called uh, multiples. They're not real. They're just multiples of what's going on on the surface. So not really any features, but there are things that are buried there. And so it's kind of interesting. The problem is <clears throat> it looks interesting, but you don't know whether this is 5,000 years ago or 105,000 years. And the only way to do that is to uh, take some cores. So this is the site that Delwood showed me, this uh, uh, green um, penta, <coughs> pentagram, or not pentagram, but <coughs> five-sided figure. And, uh, <coughs> and then we ran our sub-bottom tracks, uh, these long tracks over the, this area back and forth to see what we might find near the site, see if there was another site there. We also went across the lake in, in various areas too. And the only way you can really see what's going on, so this is, uh, this is what we call Thor's thumb um, for inside joke reasons. And uh, this is coming up on Thor's thumb. And so there is, there are, uh, geological features under the surface. This is the surface. And the only way to tell what's going on is to put a core down, pull it out like this one, <clears throat> and then date certain parts of the core where there's datable material and then see what's going on, see what you got. And so for this, so feature 220, this looked interesting. It was a hump, not really a natural phenomenon by any means. And when we uh, put the core down, we found this area of crushed shell. <clears throat> so is that <clears throat> anthropomorphic or is it fish? I mean, is it uh, birds eating shells? Both are possible. But it's, uh, we know that it dates about 16,500 years ago. So anyway, it, it's worth exploring more. And so that's uh, really sort of what you're doing. You're you're looking at the subsurface and you're driving cores and then you're analyzing the cores. Very slow process. So we took uh, several cores during that field season uh, and dated them. And uh, at the bottom, some were 46,000 years old, like way old. 
and others were 4,000 years old and then times in between. <clears throat> but we did have several um, strata that dated about the Page Latson time period. And so if people were at Page Latson, they should have been elsewhere in Florida. And so we got interested in this. Then you take these cores, you map them onto your sub bottom profile and then tie the dates together and then you can date these layers. And so this green is about 4,000 years ago. Uh, the blue is about 15,000 years ago and so on. <clears throat> well, it turns out <clears throat> unbeknownst to everybody that these sub bottom profilers which send out these chirp signals. So it's a, it's a range of signals between four and 24 kilohertz um, and are used to reflect uh, sound back and then analyze the sound. Also can resonate sound. So the difference between reflection and resonance is that if I yell at the wall, the echo comes back and that's a reflection of the sound. But the resonance is like the, is like the uh, champagne glass where I sing the right note and the champagne glass vibrates. These are two different reactions from the sound. And it turns out that within this four to 24 range, we can resonate chipstone artifacts. So these chipstone artifacts are resonating like champagne glasses and they have a different acoustical signature <clears throat> than the reflection signature. And so here's a couple of uh, blades and blade like flakes. And you can see that um, when they are hit by the right resonance, they, there's a peak sound that's coming back. Now, the companies, they don't like that. It's noise to them. And so they do whatever they can in their algorithms and their analytical algorithms to suppress that, keep it, because it just gets in the way. But nonetheless, what these resonances do is they appear, and this is not fully understood yet, they appear in the water column as a feature. So there's nothing in the water column that is reflecting this, uh, this uh, signature. This seems to be where the resonances end up manifesting themselves. And they, and they come in different flavors. So this is a, these are different sub bottom types and different algorithms that are used. So this is, this is where, this is early on, this was discovered in uh, Denmark and they call them haystacks. Uh, this is what we see with our device. Well, similar to this, but this would be another version of it. And then this is back on Thor's thumb. When we looked back at the images of all the sub bottom work we had done, we found haystacks. And so now, we were pretty sure that in fact, there were lithic artifacts there because the chances of digging or lithic or hitting a lithic artifact in a core are near zero. But now we had a way to sort of look through the surface to see whether or not there were stone tools. And this is like revolutionary for us because suddenly you can see that instead of sending a diver down 300 feet to the Clovis shoreline, and looking around, which is the definition of dangerous and crazy, uh, we could just run the sub bottom profiler back and forth over this for a week and then look at the data and see what we find. And so this would be an area that we're interested in exploring. This at the mouth of the Chesapeake would be another area we'd be interested in exploring. In fact, this will work in freshwater and in salt water. So, to switch to Maryland and how this might be helpful, this is a picture of Darren Lowry. Some of you may know him, he lives in Michigan now, but he's been doing a lot of work along the Chesapeake and has discovered some, what seem to be very early sites. Uh, they, he has collected stone tools that have washed in the water and excavated them out of the profiles. And these should be great resonators. They're the right size, they're the right material, they're chip stone and not naturally fractured. It turns out naturally fractured stone tools don't resonate. It's these hitting it with a hard hammer and somehow creates the conditions within the rock, the stresses within the rock that allows them to resonate. 
And if you look at the Paleo Susquehanna, which is would have run through the Chesapeake, you can see that there were probably lots and lots of sites along that Paleo Susquehanna, which are now uh, deeply underwater, but which the uh, our technique uh, with the subbottom profiler might be able to find. And there's the Sinmar site. Uh, this is an uh, infamous site. Uh, it's even within our company, we have people who are open to it and others say, no, it's a bunch of garbage. But this is an artifact that was dug up or uh, scraped up by scallopers, I think in the 1960s. They kept the notice of, they kept the log of it because they hit a snag. They pulled up this artifact and uh, also some mastodon remains. And so perhaps it's a place that ought to be investigated. Now, the, and this is the, this is a sub bottom, or this is a, a sonar image of where these uh, lines were that uh, apparently that the uh, scalloper had run across and they're still there, it's still scars on the bottom. This area at the mouth of the Chesapeake is really dangerous. So it's dangerous enough in the relatively calm waters of the Gulf, but out in the mid-Atlantic, it's really dangerous. But we don't have to worry about that because we could just run our sub bottom over and decide, you know, see what's down there. Um, and so we're very excited about this technology. Uh, we're working with uh, teams that are doing um, mathematical teams that are doing uh, uh, sort of the basic science to try to uh, model it. Uh, there's a PhD student at Scripps in San Diego who's working with us on the details of, of how to do this and uh, working it from another angle. Um, I would predict in probably 10 years, we'll make a device that will only look for these chip zone artifacts. My vision is that I could sit in a boat and it would ding whenever there was, it found something. And so I wouldn't have to stare at the screen the whole time. But anyway, it's coming and it'll change uh, the way we think about people on the offshore and, um, and also in freshwater conditions. So I just want to leave you with this. Uh, underwater archeology span can be a lot of fun. This is Andy Hemmings on the left and uh, uh, <clears throat> Ryan Means on the right and their new friend they found at Paige Latson. And, uh, but this can also happen. So this is Lake George after a stormy night. This is where we lost the green boat for good. We had to put that one to death. This is our pontoon boat, our research vessel. That is not our dock. It would cut loose and, and crashed into the neighbor's dock. So this is where I decided we needed to up our insurance coverage. Um, if you're interested in this, there's a book out that has a lot of this uh, discussion, especially interesting discussion about uh, what's going on now and also the earlier uh, efforts to find these sites in the offshore. And I'd like to thank uh, these organizations for funding our research and for helping us out uh, through the years and uh, hopefully into the future. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I'll take any questions you got. <clears throat> thank you, Dave. Going back through the chat, I think there were a question, there are a few questions, but I feel like they've been addressed. Um, there were some questions about the function of some of the artifacts that you showed. One was a wrench, and then there was a shaft. Um, generally, what do we know about what these artifacts were used for? The, I mean, you mentioned some were fish hooks, but can you just kind of give us a brief overview? Yes. So the wrench, uh, they call it a wrench. I don't know how it ended up with that name because it. I guess it looks like a crescent wrench of some sort, but nobody knows what the function of that is. There's only one of them that's been found. It was, I think it was found in Arizona, maybe a Blackwater draw. Uh, some think it was used as a straightener, uh, like a shaft straightener that you steam the shaft and then pull it through that. There's some wear marks on it that indicate that, excuse me, that might be what it's for, but nobody really knows. Um, the bone points, um, 
uh, could have been uh, tipped on a spear and used uh, to kill animals. Uh, there's a guy named Richard Gramley who thinks they were sled runners. Um, or they may have been what's called a foreshaft, where a stone point was attached to one end and it's slotted into a spear on the other end, but nobody really knows. I, I'm not sure what else was there. The ivory points uh, could have been projectile points, um, but these uh, pointy bone tools are found by the thousands in the Florida rivers. And so what they were used for, uh, they may have been used for lots of different things. It's really not clear. Some people think they were used as lysters for uh, catching fish, um, but it's not really clear. So two other questions have come in. Uh, the first one, what is the oldest artifact found so far in Florida? Uh, and then following up on that, any thoughts on the Sinmar compared to Solutrian? Uh, so the oldest uh, unequivocal, in my mind anyway, unequivocal artifact is that uh, biface I showed you from Paige Ladson. And so that's dated about, I think it's about 14,000 years old calibrated. So it's pretty old. It's a couple, it's a at least 1500 years older. Well, about 1500 years older than Clovis, maybe a thousand years older than Clovis. Uh, there may have been other artifacts that are not dated um, that may be older, but we don't know. Um, part of the problem with stone tools is you can't date the stone tools. It has to be found in context where uh, there is datable material. So there's datable organic material that can be radiocarbon dated. That's the best way to date something. And so that means it has to be found in context or it could be a bone tool that might uh, be dated, but there's been none that have been, old, that are older than that. So I'd say that's the oldest one. As far as the Salutrian hypothesis is concerned, uh, I got to know uh, Dennis Stanford, who was one of the uh, originators of that, along with Bruce Bradley, uh, pretty well. And I, the way I approach that, uh, I, I say it's a legitimate scientific question, um, and therefore it should be approached in that way as testable hypothesis, and that uh, people should quit yelling at each other about it and uh, start doing some science. Do you have time for one more? Sure. Uh, a couple of questions about the, the burials that you showed in the drawing. How deep were those? And do we know like why animals didn't interfere with them? Uh, they uh, look like they were in a shallow pond. Uh, so uh, I think the reconstruction I showed you that they were just under the surface. So probably not much more than, uh, I don't know, waist deep, something like that, because people had to go out there and set the dead in their, uh, in their proper position and then put stuff on them. So certainly not over their heads, um, um, but deep enough to keep most animals away. Um, in fact, I can't really think about any mammals uh, or reptiles who would be interested in eating that sort of stuff. So it's, um, I don't think that was, I don't think that was really an issue, would have been an issue. The, the burials have slumped and some of them have moved, but that's been through uh, geological processes. Um, the, the person asking the question was thinking maybe reptiles, if not mammals? I guess uh, most of the rept, I don't, I, even uh, alligators are not carrion eaters. So they're looking for I mean, they can take down big animals, including humans, but they're not, uh, they're not going on land and eating a dead whatever there. So it's, I don't think that they would really be interested in it. Uh, I mean, they could move through the area, some of the big ones, and certainly move stuff around, but I don't think they'd be doing that on purpose. 
Let's see. Uh, does anyone do DNA investigations of these Florida humans? Yeah, so in the Windover case, uh, there's a book on it, and uh, they did a DNA analysis. So that would have been done in the 1990s. So that was very early on in sort of ancient DNA uh, techniques. And they came up with some haplotypes that are X. And so X is, uh, that's one thing Europeans are, they're X haplotypes, although they're also X haplotypes in Native American populations. Since that time, uh, people have tried to replicate those studies and have been unable to extract any DNA from any of the material at Vendover. So I'd say that. Uh, it's up in the air as to whether or not, how, how much you want to trust the earlier work that was done. So uh, one thing about DNA, I'm not an expert on this, but one thing I think that happens is that in these um, wet conditions, uh, the DNA uh, can degrade pretty quickly. And it looks like that's probably what happens. So um, those would be the only human remains, early human remains in Florida uh, that I know about. 